do that? Well, uh, our only way to investigate the deep earth is what we call seismic investigation. So you blast the charge and at three different shock waves, two horizontal and a vertical one. As they travel through the earth, they would reflect from here and there when there's a change, usually in the phase or in the density of the rock. So there's a reflection. It's like a sonar, but it can go actually through the entire planet. Today we got to the level of technology that we can actually produce a CAT scan of planet Earth. But, but instead of X-rays, we use, still use shock waves. So you have a slicing up of the planet and you can see through it. And in the middle of a fairly homogeneous formation like the mantle, you find this very obvious anomaly. Now what is it? The, the, the drop in the speed of the, the shock waves indicates it must be something like water. Water is the only logical uh, interpretation. So. That's how we understand the inner structure of the Earth. Of course, it's not the ultimate proof, because unless you really go down there to see it, you can't really say it's that. But it's the most logical uh, interpretation of the geophysical data. Now, I, I read something in the um, material that um, surrounds you relative to uh, huge glaciers mm. uh, underground. Yes. I, I've never heard of that. What, what, what's up with that? Well, imagine a big hole in the ground, which doesn't have connection to other holes. It's just like a deep shaft with a chamber at the bottom. And if this happens in a temperate climate, in the wintertime, snow would fall down in there. That would overcool the rock walls. When in the summer, there's no warm air getting, that, getting down there because the cold air is trapped. Now, if a certain ratio of volume and the size of the opening is, is achieved, then, basically, you'll have water infiltrating in the spring when the melt starts at the surface, but the temperatures inside the cave are still below zero. So whatever water drops in there actually freezes. And it creates a layer of, of a layer of a layer of ice. So you have blocks of ice underground. The world's biggest one is in uh, Slovakia, actually, in Europe. Uh, I think it's Dobšinska. It's something like 145,000 cubic meters of ice. The one that I have investigated for many years with a team from my uh, institute, the Speleological Institute in Romania, is 75,000 cubic meters of ice, over a thousand layers of ice in which you can analyze. You can get fine branches in there and all sorts of wooden debris from the surface. So it just stays in a cave unless a major climate shift occurs, so then it starts uh, melting. And actually we were the only team in the world to investigate paleoclimate in a glacier inside a cave. And actually, my team and I, myself, work with a team from Grenoble in France, who are the best specialists in glaciology worldwide. They are the ones who have analyzed the famous Vostok ice core. So we had a very good archive there, and actually that ice formed since 800 AD until present. And we have that very clearly determined. Which, was that a surprise to the experts? So, I mean, it was, the, because the, they expected it to be much older than that. I was going to say that. the assumption would be it would be much older than that. But it was 800 AD. Now, uh, I know that we've got a lot of gaps here, and that's why I have to have you back. But w what is your educated guess right now in terms of the age of our planet? Well, I'm, I'm not allowed to guess as an educated person because my education would say it's certain that's 4.7 billion years for the okay. planet, planet okay. right? But that's not the kind of uh, uh, age I agree with. I can only trust one who has been there from the beginning, who is God. Now, if I read his word, there's no place where it has a label saying, I created the world 6,000 years ago. No. But there's enough indication there to take the genealogies and everything else to estimate an age of 6,000 years. The big question is not how really old is the Earth, it's the, the, the order of magnitude. Now, if it is within the thousands of years rather than billions of years, can that explain the geology? Without the global flood, it cannot. With a global flood, it can. Mm. And that's, that's my conviction now. It's not my guesstimate uh, because I have no other means but that to, 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 to bring it down to this order of magnitude. Now, there, there would be critics who would say uh, Dr. Emil Silvestru is very convincing, but he's also a believer, which uh, therefore means his science is uh, slanted. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see uh, all of this through the lens of your biblical belief, or do you see the Bible supporting what you know to be true as a scientist? Or is it both and? There's, there is a very important thing to, to be properly understood. Number one, there's no person that doesn't have a bias, a worldview. Right. You, if you, a person says he's unbiased, that person is not a person, he's a vegetable. Every, everybody has to have a worldview. It's the way you interpret the world before you start interpreting it. That's the way in which you've been, the paradigm in which you've been educated. So, of course, you will interpret facts according to it. Uh, number two is, 
You see, there are two kinds of creation. It's theological creation, which uses as its yardstick a sacred text. And then there's scientific creationism. Now, scientific creationism agrees with all areas of science. Science is just the same, except the way you interpret origins, which is historical science, because there are two kinds of science. There's experimental, operational, or empirical science, dealing with things that happen now, you devise experiments, you build technology out of that. But then there's historical science, trying to interpret the past, which cannot be experimentally proven. Of course, when you interpret the past, what do you use? A paradigm your way of interpreting the past. There's no direct evidence, evidence from the past. If you find something, it needs to be interpreted. A bone is just a bone. It doesn't say a thing until you start putting your interpretation into it. So that's why the same bone can be evidence for billions of years if your paradigm is searching for that, naturalism. But it can also be evidence for a catastrophe if your paradigm is creation. So, uh, a recent find last week in Ethiopia, in the Afar region, Yes. Uh, everybody's excited about it. What's your perspective RDP on that? Takers. Well, first of all, that's a, a recent find is a misnomer. That thing was lying in a drawers for 15 years. It's been already interpreted once. Articles have been published 15 years ago about it. Huh. Now they reinterpreted it. So it's a new reinterpretation of, old, of the old thing. Now, why is it a reinterpretation? Because they've changed the scenario so much, so they eventually got to that drawer. Oh, wait, what do we do with this guy? Now, it can't be that, because now we have this. So let's reinterpret it into that. What do you want? I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Because they had bones in Europe, which everybody agreed were skulls of Neanderthals. They looked like Neanderthals, they felt like Neanderthals, except it turns out that they're aged 240 years. Therefore, they, can't be not, they cannot be Neanderthals. But what makes a Neanderthal a Neanderthal? The way it looks, right? So you see, it's so misleading mm. because it's not the bone that speaks, it's the age that they calculate with it. Mm. If it fits the model, it's kept. If not, it's reinterpreted. So this is a reinforcement syndrome. That's what I happens. Think, I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul's words, now I see through a glass darkly. We've only got a minute left. I, I wanted to sh show this. Uh, who, who, who's, uh, who, who's, who's this? That's my wife. That's your wife. Now, that's when she was uh, a world-class sprinter and hurdler and long jumper for the Romanian uh, athletics team. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have been here. Yeah. She's the one who brought me to Christ. She's the one that brought you to faith. Uh, here's an interesting shot. This is one of your daughters and your wife together. Yes. seems to me there's a lot of similarities between... Uh, oh, uh, Alexandra and Flori, yes. And then here's another shot of your two girls. Yeah. Lovely, lovely girls. What are the names Cora. again? Cora. Alexandra and Cora. And how old are they? 28 and 23. Beautiful. And then, here's one quick shot I wanted to show. Your wife has um, uh, done a lot of spelunking with you. Last 30 years. Since 30 years. Together, together, you yeah. know, I'm looking at you and I'm saying, how can you be a spelunker? Your, your, your shoulders are too wide. I mean, you gotta, you got to squeeze through some really narrow gaps, right? Well... Do you ever get stuck? I did, but uh, just for a short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> You're obviously not claustrophobic. No, I'm not even afraid of... Uh, Santa Claus, because it's also <laughs> claustrophobia. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, Dr. Emil Silvestri is uh, a geologist. He's been my guest, and I promise you, friends, we will have him back again in the future, as the Lord wills, uh, to talk about um, other things like uh, geology supporting the scripture, uh, talking with someone who's a total unbeliever and, and trying to argue you into atheism, uh, and also the uh, the issue of astronomy, and can you trust the Bible when it comes to astronomy? These things in the future as Dr. Emil Sylvester returns to 100 Street. Thanks for coming our way. Thank you.